My next guest is from a state that gets a lot of attention during a presidential election, probably the most important state out there uh, as far as today goes, you know, and, and, and particularly with conventions going on. Francis Suarez is mayor of Miami, Florida. He has made affordable housing a key priority of his, and his most recent efforts on this front, front call for the creation or refurbishment of 12,000 affordable housing units in the next four years. Mayor Suarez, great to see you again. And first of all, let me just say I'm glad you're back to health. Uh, we had a conversation, of course, because you've gone through uh, COVID personally, and you've also seen what's happened in your community. Let me, uh, you know, I, I was just, you know, we've talked before, but I just want to say, I was reading up on the things that you've been doing, not only refurbishing houses, but you were involved with passing reverse red line legislation that was designed to undo some of the bad decisions that have been tied to systemic racism and divide and division. And this, I just wanted to start with this because this seems like a big deal to me. Tell me what went on there and tell me what you are dismantling. What went on there was we sued and we took on uh, the big banks uh, that were what they call um, reverse redlining. Redlining uh, before was they would draw a red line around a map and wouldn't lend uh, in that area and areas that were typically uh, African-American, areas that were typically impoverished. Um, and now what we were seeing um, in the last mortgage crisis was what we what we call them what became known as reverse redlining, which was essentially that they were lending in those areas, but they were lending on more onerous terms uh, to minorities than to non-minorities. And it was very easy to detect because you could uh, compare credit profiles, you can compare income. I mean, these were all objective measurements. And so that uh, case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court held that we could, in fact, sue uh, the, the big banks. And so uh, the objective there was to make sure that, uh, you know, discriminatory lending practices are not something that continue to perpetuate uh, racism in our community. And particularly um, when it comes to, uh, you know, financial uh, decisions such as buying a home, which is in many uh, cases the most expensive, uh, the single largest purchase that anybody makes, and it has to be done in an equitable fashion if we want to have an equitable city. Mayor, what are the building blocks as you see it today as you deal with um, you know, some of the hits that your community has taken, both economically and through health? How do you keep the affordable housing picture in it, given I'm sure you know, your, your uh, revenues have had a tough time, but you know, I'm just interested in what that map looks like of how you take care of the most vulnerable communities, the people that need housing, keep that in the picture while you have lots of other challenges happening. It's definitely difficult. Uh, without a doubt, we've been hit uh, very hard, uh, like many cities throughout the country. We had a surplus going into COVID and now have a $25 million deficit for this year and a $30 million deficit for next year. So we're hoping that Congress acts uh, to help cities and to help its residents. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, we're blessed that to have a general obligation bond, which was called Miami Forever. And a part of that Miami Forever bond, $100 million was for affordable housing. So we, we have uh, some resources that we can uh, spend uh, to help this, you know, deal with this very, very difficult. It's, it's another pandemic, if you will, this need for affordable housing, this need for equ economic equity in our community. And government can't solve all the problems. But we can certainly do what we can. And, and that was, by the way, a voter approved bond uh, that allowed us to spend now $100 million creating affordable housing. So that's going to be tax credit deals. That's going to be home ownership deals so that people can uh, buy and build equity uh, in their communities. And I'm working with uh, all the elected officials in my city, all the commissioners, uh, to try to program uh, the spending of those funds in a way that maximizes, like you said, and helps us meet our goal of 12,000 units by uh, 2024. You know, one of the things I've read is that you're taking um, advantage of the Opportunity Zone uh, tax exclusion to get, get monies to address uh, affordable housing. Last night, Senator Tim Scott, who worked with Senator Cory Booker in putting forward uh, opportunity, opportunity Zones, getting them into the tax bill. I mean, I remember when it happened because it was uh, something people didn't know where they were going to go, and it sort of snuck in at the last moment. Um, it wasn't the conscientious thing everybody thought at the time, but it was, it was interesting. Are Opportunity Zones working out for you? Are they giving you the resources and direction and capital you need to make a dent in affordable housing? They are. And we just did uh, a project that I broke ground on with the Department of HUD, which was the first workforce housing uh, project. Oftentimes, uh, you know, you have uh, through the tax credit system, affordable housing projects. Sometimes you have what they call extremely low income projects. But oftentimes the workforce housing a piece uh, gets overlooked. And that's your doctors, your nurses, your police officers, your firefighters, uh, those that 
for many years have not been able to afford to live in the city. And thanks to the Department of HUD, and thanks to Opportunity Zones and the leverage that it creates, we were able to put together a deal uh, where the Department of, of Housing and Urban Development lent about uh, 60 million out of a $70 million project uh, so that we could create that kind of workforce housing in an area where there is basically only at market or affluent uh, people living, which is uh, the omni area of our downtown. And so we now have the ability to attract uh, the working class in our community that deserves to uh, work and live uh, close to each other uh, like they haven't been able to do, unfortunately, for several decades. What are your biggest problems, Mayor, that you want this Washington community to hear about what you're, ha you're struggling with right now, and particularly these communities? We have a lot of policymakers watching this, but what do you think? I mean, I know you're here a lot. I see you when you come up, and, but, but what do these folks uh, in D.C. need to hear that they're not hearing uh, from mayors of cities like yours? They need to hear a few things. One of them is, uh, and, and some of this is pre-COVID, but one of the things that they need to hear is uh, our cities are exploding in terms of growth which means that it's becoming more and more difficult for the market to provide the kind of affordable housing uh, that is needed. There are uh, uh, you know, models that have been proven and that work. You don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. You know, We always try to find exotic and new ways uh, to provide housing and to be creative. But the truth of the matter is a lot of the programs uh, that we know already work are programs where you have a public sector uh, and private sector uh, partnership. And we do that, for example, in the city, and I'm sure many other cities do it as well, by contributing land. Uh, we, we're a landowner, and we, we also have a land that's inefficiently developed. And so oftentimes we'll, we'll partner with a private sector that'll take the risk. They'll take the risk to make sure that a project remains affordable for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, and, and they're risking uh, their, their ability to make profit, and they're also limiting uh, the increase, uh, you know, the ability to increase rents which is something uh, that is done through that collaboration process. Uh, we like to do it through the carrot approach. And so all we're asking from Washington and from the state, frankly, is to dedicate a you know, significant portion of the revenues that they generate uh, to create, uh, to help us create cities uh, where we can have those frontline workers, a lot of which, by the way, were exposed during COVID, the nurses, uh, you know, uh, teachers now that when school, you know, when now we're back to school, uh, police officers and firefighters. Police officers and firefighters are the, one of the highest category of professions that have gotten infected by COVID. So they deserve uh, the support uh, of not only the private sector, but also the public sector as well. You know, I want to remind our audience that you, Francis, were the second person diagnosed uh, with COVID that came down with COVID. Um, and you went through a process and, you know, several efforts uh, to get to negative and that you struggle with this, you know, personally. And I and, and you were also the first mayor to put in place um, stay at home orders, first mayor to put in a curfew, really to wrestle this down within Miami. And then, of course, we saw the tragic next wave that came in. I'm just interested. You worked so hard to kind of keep your community safe, and yet it still came in. What happened? I think what happened, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States summarized it pretty well. Uh, when we opened, uh, I think there was a feeling that it was like the last day of school, you know, where the last day of school, everybody just uh, almost forgot about the fact that there was this highly infectious virus in our community. And, uh, you know, the virus, one of the things it's demonstrated is, is its own resilience and its own uh, efficiency in spreading. And so, you know, I was also in the second wave, the first city to implement a mask in public rule. And that mask in public rule is what now uh, has brought us down to levels uh, just the other day, uh, the day before yesterday, we we're at 500 uh, new cases per day, which, which is something we haven't seen since April. So uh, we were at 3,500 new cases a day for, for uh, a while. Um, so that's about one seventh, uh, you know, what we were at, at our high point. So, you know, you have to make tough decisions. Um, we, you know, I never got into politics ever thinking that I would close a business or an industry uh, or ask uh, people to do things that they may feel uncomfortable with. But the fact of the matter is, uh, when the health and safety of your residents are at risk, you have to make dif difficult leadership decisions, um, you know, keeping in mind and understanding that you're saving lives in the, at, the, you know, at the end of the day. You know, we heard, I asked Mayor uh, Giles of Mesa, Arizona, uh, this question. Um, because I think you hear different, you hear different currents, and I've been watching. We watched the the convention last night and heard uh, folks saying, "Hey, we're against zoning changes of sing single family homes." And just raised the question of, you know, in Miami, is there, you know, when when you make the moves on affordable housing, when you make the moves to support those in need, is that a point of pride? 
Is that something folks are ashamed of or want to keep distance? How do you kind of build it in? Because I see it as a part of a healthy community, but I know that there's that's not shared uh, uh, across the board. How, I mean, I'm, we've known each other. How do you shape it so that those people that are um, need affordable housing, that need rental assistance, that need a uh, helping hand at this time, where it's not uh, tainted with, with, with some sort of stain? It's, it's tough at times, uh, and, and sometimes you'll get people, and this is, I find it a little bit funny, not funny, but somewhat tragic in, in a way, when someone will tell me we do an affordable housing project, and it's a beautiful project because the projects that we do now are in collaboration with the private sector, and so they're done as if as if they were luxury condos. And somebody will say, "Well, I don't want to live. I want to. I want to. I want affordable housing, but I don't want to live in that neighborhood." And and that's sad. You know, it saddens me because, uh, you know, getting the you know, there's so much demand for affordable housing, and there's so few supply that when somebody gets it, they ought to feel like you know they were very fortunate, and and that they're getting something that not too many people have. Um, one of the things that we also looked at is. You know, sometimes when people get an affordable housing uh, unit, there's this perception that they're taken care of, that they're okay. And one of the things that we realize is that elderly people who are living on fixed income were not okay um, because uh, within the covenants of some of these develop, uh, you know, developments, developers were able to raise uh, the rents. You know, they were still, you know, according to the area median income, they were still affordable, but uh, they were able to raise them by more than what the social security. Uh, you know, uh, monies that were being received by the elderly were increasing, mm. uh, actually substantially more. So we had to create another program to help uh, elderly in our community uh, with a rental assistance program that helped bridge that gap. So I think, you know, in, in our community, uh, when people are suffering, uh, they're not shy about asking for help. They're not shy about applying for help. I'm just, I'm just saddened by the fact that sometimes we just don't have enough supply to meet the demand. You know, just just finally, uh, Mayor. You know, one of the um, things that you taught me when we when I interviewed you for the Hills Coronavirus Report, and I just kept referencing it over and over and over again, was that many people in this community, we were all pushed in our homes. People were forgetting about the mental health impacts. You know, about you know uh, 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 family abuse and spousal abuse and other issues that are going on on that front, and that this disconnect from people as people move into their face with something. But I also think it's very much a part of the affordable. Uh, housing picture too, and I'm I'm I thought it was profound that you said it, and I'm just wondering what is Miami doing on that front? And again, talking to a national audience, what do we need to be doing more of on this mental health side and on communities being empathetic and helping uh, uh, folks that are not handling this uh, time we're in at this time of uh, coronavirus um, so easily? This has been an incredibly challenging time, you know, uh, things that uh, have, you know, since systemic racism and, and what, how it's inordinately affected certain populations uh, with COVID, this has been like ripping off the bandaid and, and really exposing how vulnerable uh, certain people are in our community. And as you said, you know, one of the things that we saw was our reporting on domestic violence went down and under normal circumstances, you would be thrilled. Uh, but we felt that the fact that people were being forced to stay home uh, was creating a climate where uh, where victims felt that they had no place to go. And so I think, you know, we're urging people to please reach out and please uh, ask for resources. We do have uh, some federal funding uh, that we've received uh, at the county level, um, and we can urge our county officials uh, to help us uh, combat this problem, which is a problem that gets exacerbated uh, when people are stressed out about not being able to find work about all the different restrictions and their inability to provide for their families. I mean, that's an incredible amount of stress under normal circumstances and under circumstances like this where you're seeing record levels of unemployment, uh, it just gets uh, multiplied. Just real quick as we just finish up, Mayor, how's the morale of your team? How's the morale of the frontline folks, the folks that report to you? Um, out, you know, we sometimes forget that, that there's an infrastructure around mayors and providing these services. Are they upbeat about the future? Are they downbeat about the times? Stressed out beyond belief? Where, where are they? I think we're upbeat because we've had a good uh, few weeks. Uh, we were at, a, like I said, at a high point of 3,500 cases a day. We're now down to you know, 800 to 500 per day. So I think the, the fact that there's significant improvement, the fact that our hospitalizations, which were at a high of 2,300 COVID cases uh, in, the, in the hospital system are now down to about 1,100, uh, means that our hospital system is far less stressed than it was uh, just a few weeks ago. 
Uh, so that's positive. I think, though, you know, this has been a very tough year, 2020. You've had frontline workers that have been dealing with COVID, with uh, civil unrest. Um, you know, it, it's not been a year where people have been able to really um, relax. And so, uh, you know, it, it's been tough, but we have a resilient city. Uh, we continue to focus on our, our resiliency uh, metrics because uh, we understand that this is a dynamic world that we live in. And uh, to be truly resilient is to be able to deal with all the different kinds of shocks and stresses uh, that we're going to be continually hit with going forward. Well, look, I have the privilege of calling you and talking to you a lot about these issues because you happen to be at the nexus of so many of these storms at once. So, Mayor Francis Suarez of Miami, thank you so much for joining us, as always, and giving us your time. Always, always here for you. Thank you very much.